Now it's time for the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening, Lawrence. Good evening, Rachel. And we will have uh, Steve Kornacki back at the other end of the hour tonight uh, to update us on where things stand on that. And Great. today, Rachel, n the defense rested. No witnesses, no testimony from Paul Manafort. Uh, we will, jury will have this case tomorrow night. It seems like the defense was pretty restful yes. before they rested. You know what I mean? Yes. Like they did, not only did they not put the defendant on the stand, which of course would have been amazing blockbuster drama, uh, but they didn't put any other witnesses on the stand, nor did they introduce evidence. Um, uh, substantial evidence. So it's, I mean, I, this is a le legitimate and mainstream legal theory about how you um, defend your, your client. You try to create the impression in the jury that the prosecution doesn't even bear responding to their case was so weak. But th those closing arguments tomorrow are going to be a big deal. It's going to be fascinating. I mean, there's, there's one line of evidence in this case that stands completely unrefuted by the defense. There was no cross-examination on this. And that was a, a Treasury official getting on the stand and saying, Paul Manafort did not report the existence of the following foreign bank accounts. That's the description of a crime for the defense not to put something on the stand to refute that, to say it wasn't Paul Manafort's responsibility, something, anything. There's, there's no defense on that kind. I know. I mean, there, there, there was discussion on cross-examination, on, I'm going to get this exactly, there was some discussion of like, was Paul Manafort's signature on financial documents really his signature? Like, conceivably, in closing arguments, they could raise the issue that like, everything that it looks like Paul Manafort signed was actually secretly signed by big, evil Rick Gates, and he's the real criminal, and Paul Manafort had no idea. Like, I could see maybe they'll make that claim, but you're right, in terms of the documentary evidence, they're not refuting the documents. They may mount some late effort to refute that the, that he really signed off on those documents. But other than that, I don't know how they're gonna. I don't know how they're gonna bring this around. Well, there are limits on final argument. We'll see how strict this judge wants to be. But it becomes difficult at certain points to argue things that were never in any way put in evidence. And, yes. And that's. To me, it sounds like the defense argument is going to have to be things that were not put in evidence, but that's what we're going to find out tomorrow. Exactly. Thank you, Thank friend. you, Rachel. What is wrong with Donald Trump? What is wrong with the president of the United States? That is what most of America is wondering today. After the president of the United States tweeted one of the ugliest statements he has ever made in a long lifetime of very ugly statements. The tweet was met with outrage by former director of the CIA, John Brennan, who will join us later in this hour, and countless political commentators on television and online. Democrats ac across the country expressed outrage, and Republicans, as usual, were virtually silent. There was one Republican tweet out of the United States Senate about the president's tweet today from retiring Senator Jeff Flake saying this kind of language is unbecoming of a president of the United States. There's no excuse for it. and Republicans should not be okay with it. That's it. That's what the Republicans had to say. The president's language that Jeff Flake is talking about including, included calling a person a dog. The tweet was, of course, about Omarosa, who as part of a publicity tour for her book about working in the Trump campaign in the Trump White House, released an audio recording on television this morning in which she and two other women campaign operatives discussed how to handle the possible revelation of an audio recording of Donald Trump using the N-word. All of the women in the discussion, especially Omarosa and Katrina Pearson, assumed that such a recording probably did exist. And they were absolutely certain that Donald Trump knew that he had used the N-word. I'm trying to find out at least what context it was used in to help us maybe try to figure out a way to spin it. I said, well, sir, can you think of any time that this might have happened? And he said, no. Well, that's not you true. Know, how do you so... He goes, how do you think I should handle it? And I told him exactly what you just said, Omarosa, which is, well, it depends on what scenario you're talking about. And he said, well, why don't you just go ahead and put it to bed? I he don't know it. what the scandal is. <laughs> no, he said it. He's embarrassed. There is nothing more important to know about a president than the president's mental health. And this week, Omarosa is the one.
who is giving us the clearest picture of the president's current mental state, not by anything she says in her book or in her interviews, by what, by, by, but by what she is provoking the president himself to say, what she is provoking the president to reveal about himself. Donald Trump is now and always has been throughout his life the most damaging witness against Donald Trump, and Donald Trump is doing it again with Omarosa's publicity tour underway in which she switches sides from Trump defender to Trump, Trump accuser, accusing the president of being a racist. The president did everything he possibly could today to support the charge that he is a racist when he tweeted this at 7.31 a.m. right after Omarosa played that tape on television of campaign operatives sharing her belief that Donald Trump did indeed use the n-word. Now I'm going to leave that tweet on the screen for you in the television audience to read, but I apologize to our listeners on Sirius XM Radio at the moment because I'm not going to read this one aloud. It is just too disgusting. And saying these words of Donald Trump would sicken me. Donald Trump's personal attacks on Twitter used to amuse me when they were aimed at me. I was the first person in television news that Donald Trump decided to attack on Twitter when I started saying Donald Trump was not as rich as he claimed to be. He threatened to sue me on Twitter then. I responded that he would never sue me because he couldn't afford it because he's not as rich as he says he is. That was in 2011. Donald Trump continued to attack me in 2011. And for years after that, because I was the first and for a very long time the only person calling Donald Trump a liar because of his relentless lying about President Obama's birth certificate, I used Twitter to invite Donald Trump onto this program, knowing that he would refuse because he would only do television interviews that he believed could, he could control, and so our exchanges were limited to Twitter. In December of 2011, he said that I was not long for TV, and he has a face made for radio. In 2012, he called me the dumbest political commentator on television, said I will soon be thrown off the air. He called me too stupid, the dumbest man on TV, a very dumb guy, and a fool. But he never called me a dog. Why didn't he go all the way with me? Why did he stop far, far short of calling me an animal, a dog? What did I do to deserve his mercy? Well, for one thing, I'm white. So were we seeing the outburst of a lifelong racist today who believes that substituting the word dog for the N-word is his presidential way of cleaning up his racism for public consumption? Is that what this week's news has provoked? A look into the racist mind of Donald Trump? Or is it a look into an increasingly crazed and dangerous mind. If you worried about the workings of Donald Trump's mind when you listened to him pathologically lying about President Obama's birth certificate, he hasn't gotten any better. If you worried about the workings of Donald Trump's mind during his speech announcing his candidacy for the presidency, he hasn't gotten any better. If, if you worried about the workings of Donald Trump's mind in the first year of his presidency, he hasn't gotten any better. He's getting worse. There is something seriously wrong with the president of the United States, and it is getting worse. Last year saw the publication of this book, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump. 27 psychiatrists and mental health experts assess a president. That was a big bestseller. Some of the authors of that book told us on this program last year that the president was going to get worse as the pressures around him increased, including the investigative pressures brought by Special Prosecutor Robert Mueller. They were right. Donald Trump's tweet today was a plea for sympathy from his voters and supporters to the people who he promised he would hire the very best people and bring them into the White House. Today he said that it was his decision as president to hire a person who he then says he knew was crazed at the time. That was his word, crazed. And he says he did it because he wanted to give a crazed friend of his a break. The break he wanted to give her 
was a $180,000 a year job in the White House where she would be paid exactly the same as the White House chief of staff, the highest pay grade in the White House. Donald Trump told his followers today that instead of giving it to one of the best people, he gave it to a crazed person, an unqualified person, just to give her a break. In other words, he was giving away $180,000 of their taxpayer money to someone he knew did not deserve it and could not earn it. That was his story today. And that is one of the very definitions of the swamp that Donald Trump promised to drain, giving top paid government jobs to your unqualified friends. Very, very swampy thing. But Donald Trump told that to his followers today because he believes that he has twisted their minds to the point where they would read that poisonous tweet and think, what a nice guy. He tried to give a crazed friend a break. How deeply crazy is that? How crazed is the thinking? How perverse is the working of the mind that composed that presidential tweet this morning? And what does it mean for the country and the world that the most incompetent, most ignorant, the most emotionally unstable president in history is not getting better. He is getting much, much worse. Leading off our discussion now is Eddie Glaude, chairman of the Department of African American Studies at Princeton University and an MSNBC contributor. Also joining us is Zerlina Maxwell, senior director of progressive programming at Sirius XM Radio and an MSNBC political analyst. And John Heilman with us, is with us, national affairs analyst for NBC News and MSNBC. He is co-host and executive producer of Showtime's The Circus. Uh, Professor Glaude, uh, please start us off here with your reaction to what we've seen today. It's profoundly disturbing. Um, it, it, it suggests that uh, we are standing at the precipice of a crisis. It, it, it obviously reveals uh, that the president of the United States is, it confirms actually that he is a racist. Uh, the, his reaction to, to Omarosa and the tapes uh, this morning suggests, at least to me, that he is deeply concerned about more information being revealed. Uh, it's interesting uh, in your, in your uh, introduction uh, Lawrence, that you talked about his mental health. And in Omarosa's book, Unhinged, she actually reflects on his mental health. She, she actually gives the president, puts it in his file, his, his stack, a study linking Diet Cokes to dementia. Uh, because she sees him, in some interesting sorts of ways, losing it, not exhibiting the kind of qualities that she's known, uh, uh, witnessed in him for the last 15 years. But what we see here very clearly is a nation in crisis, that the office is being debased and that we have a person in the office who in so many ways, right, is just failing us at every turn. Zerlina, what did you feel this morning when you read that tweet from the president? Well, it's like you wake up to it and you're like, he's calling a black woman a dog. And so as a black woman who doesn't want to, f to feel like I have to go out and publicly defend Omarosa, um, I still feel empathy in this moment because nothing that she has done up until this point, does, she doesn't deserve to be called an animal or to be compared to a dog. And I also say, think that, you know, the idea that her credibility is questionable is, is, is almost amusing because if you can think about the defense of the White House, they're saying she's a liar because she said all these nice things about Donald Trump. She said he was not a racist. Now she's saying he's a racist and that makes him a liar even though there's all this evidence in public that we can look at and verify for ourselves. Um, but the idea that she lied about him not being a racist is interesting to me. Uh, and John, as usual, the worst possible witness uh, against Donald Trump is Donald Trump. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Here he is, he's accused uh, by someone who used to defend him against charges of being a racist. He's now accused of being a racist. Um, and th there's something about that that is hollow after she has spent so much time defending him. But then he comes out. He comes out and says, here, add this as exhibit A to your proof that I'm a racist. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it suggests not only that he is, as she calls him, unhinged, but also mm -hmm. just a, kind of a moron. I mean, the, the, just mm -hmm. he's supposed to be such a great media strategist for himself. Uh, and, and, you know, and there are some ways that he has been. Uh, but 
to, to send that tweet, again, not just in the context of her accusing him of being racist, but also the context of, are there tapes out there with me using the N-word? Well, Mark Burnett called me last night. We still don't necessarily believe mm -hmm. that's true because Mark Burnett has not yet publicly avowed that he made that call. He says, I did not. I've never called someone an N-word. It's not in my vocabulary, but I'll tell you what is in my vocabulary. It would be to call a black woman a dog. Yeah. I, I'll say, though, that to your point about what's really wrong with him, that the, the particular kind of defect that you've been describing, one of the element of it, at least, is this pathological narcissism. And the most revealing tweet to me was the one he sent pr the previous morning mm -hmm. in which he talks about how everybody said terrible things about her. She was nasty to people, would constantly yeah. miss meetings and work. When General Kelly came on board, he told me she was a loser and nothing but problems. Again, he called her crazed in the tweet today. Mm -hmm. So he's got all that evidence of her time in the White House. Everyone says she's terrible. I told him to try to work it out if possible because she only said great things about me, right? Mm -hmm. right? That was the standard. Not right. just that he gave this high-priced White House job to a friend of his to give her a break even though she was crazed and a lowlife. He says even after 18 months in the White House or a year in the White House when he had all this evidence that she was failing utterly at her job, he said, please, let's try to keep her on board because she says nice things about me. That is pretty much exhibit A in the case of Donald Trump as pathological narcissist. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Glaude, you know, when I, uh, th there is this notion of Donald Trump is, is much, much, much harsher and nastier uh, when he's attacking black people, whether it be black athletes, black women. Uh, and whenever I watch that argument unfold, I look at the things he said about me. Uh, he, he's, he says, you know, Don Lemon's the dumbest guy on television. Well, that's what he says now. He used to say that I was. And so you can take some of these things and match them up. But what you cannot do is you cannot find the spot where Donald Trump goes all the way to animal with me. And I'm very aware of what he said about me. And I'm very aware of the obvious difference between me and the people that he has decided to call animals, in this case, uh, Omarosa this week. A am I uh, overemphasizing this notion of he only went so far with me, possibly because I'm white? No, no I don't think so. I think if we look at um, uh, uh, the, 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 his, the entirety of his comments, right, when he's talking about uh, uh, undocumented workers uh, or he's talking about MS-13, they're animals. This is an infestation. Uh, when he's talking about low IQ Maxine Waters or dumb black, you know, when he's talking about dumb black people, throw the SOBs out, s whole countries, right? It reveals in interesting sorts of ways, in very problematic ways, a deep-seated disdain for these folks and a willingness to dehumanize them. And so it's in that mode, it's in that kind of discursive mode, right, where we see Donald Trump in some ways participating in a long line of, of assumptions and stereotypes about black people's capacities, about communities of color. And in some ways, it fits, I think, Lawrence, in his, in his overall kind of stance as a cultural warrior, right? So there's a way in which he imagines, remember, he was just over in Europe saying that immigration threatened the very threatened to change the very fabric of, of Europe, echoing, or Laura, Laura Ingram echoing that point, right? There's a sense of, the, of whiteness that informs how Donald Trump sees himself, understands the country, and particularly how he relates to his base. So I don't think you're being, um, um, I don't think you're overreading the moment. I think you're spot on, actually. Uh, I want to go to something that happened in the White House press briefing room today. And of course, like every Trump White House press briefing, a question was asked, that was inconceivable in any previous White House, a question that we've never heard before. This time, the question is, uh, is there an audio recording of the president using the N-word? Let's watch how this unfolded. Can you stand at the podium and guarantee the American people they'll never hear Donald Trump utter the N-word on a recording in any context? Uh, I can't guarantee uh, anything, but I can tell you that the president addressed this question directly. I can tell you that I've never heard it. Just to be clear, you can't guarantee it. I, I, look, I haven't been in every single room. Uh, Zerlina? Just to be clear, she can't guarantee. Well, the thing that's so funny about that is I think that's the one moment we've seen her telling the truth in that she doesn't know <laughs> what, if the tape exists because that, that's the honest truth. Um, and that's the problem here is that there may be a tape that exists of the president of the United States um, calling black people the N-word. And in particular, they, he was speaking about allegedly Kwame Jackson, who was a contestant in season one. And so I think the idea that we need a tape in order to verify whether or not Donald Trump is a racist is also an amusing conversation, particularly for a black 
for black people. Um, because is a tape really going to change the minds of the 30 percent of Trump voters who, up until this point, post Charlottesville, post there were good people standing with the Nazis? If they have not left Donald Trump's camp at this point, they are never leaving. But we also need to talk to the rest of white America, the, the folks that are a little bit more moderate, the folks that don't necessarily talk about race or think about race every day. And we need to use this moment to point out how racism actually manifests. It's not manifesting in the N-word. I can count on one hand the times I've been called the N-word in my mm -hmm. life, but the, the amount mm -hmm. of microaggressions and everyday racism that black people and people of color experience all over this country is something that is an everyday reality. In addition, Donald Trump has brown children incarcerated right now on the border, separated from their parents mm -hmm. still. That is racist as well. Uh, John, uh, what did you make of that Sarah Sanders moment? Uh, th there's plenty of ways to handle that rather than just say, I, I can't guarantee anything. It, I think it speaks to partly what Zerlina said, which is that she, somewhere in her, in her gut, thinks that maybe this tape's out there. She understands. So what? She could say she could lie I, today I, 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 and say, I, I, I guarantee you, there's no tape. She's, there can be a tape tomorrow, and that she's been through that. A and thousand she has times. clearly lied about a lot of things, which gets me to the second point, which yeah. I think is that this gives you a sense of how explosive this particular yeah. piece of invective is. She has lied promiscuously about many things and has not cared many times not even tried to go back and clean up the lies. This particular word, for the reasons that Zerlina said, you don't need the N-word to prove someone's a racist. Donald yeah. Trump's whole life, whether there's an N-word or not, is proof of, that someone is an obvious racist. But the race, that, that word is a, has particular power, uh, is particularly horrible, as Donald Trump, favorite adjective of his. And I think it just gives you a sense of how much power it has that even someone like Sarah Hupke Sanders, who's lies so promiscuously, looks at it and says, you know, I need to hedge my bets on this mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to break it here. Zerlina Maxwell, Professor Eddie Glaud, and John Heilman, thank you for starting us off tonight. This morning, former CIA Director John Brennan tweeted this to President Trump. It's astounding how often you fail to live up to minimum standards of decency, civility, and probity. John Brennan will join us next and tell us why he also said this morning that the president's indecency is, quote, dangerous for our nation. Today, in response to the president's most crazed tweet of the day, the Obama administration's former CIA director, John Brennan, tweeted to the president, it's astounding how often you fail to live up to minimum standards of decency, civility, and probity. Seems like you will never understand what it means to be president, nor what it takes to be a good, decent, and honest person. So disheartening, so dangerous for our nation. Joining us now, former CIA Director John Brennan. He is our senior national security and intelligence analyst for MSNBC and NBC News. Uh, Director Brennan, what the last part of your tweet it, it cap, uh, really captured my attention, saying that it's so dangerous for our, our nation. In, in what ways? Well, good evening, Lawrence, and thank you for having me on. Uh, well, I think in two principal ways. First, I think Donald Trump has badly sullied the reputation of the office of the presidency with his invective, with his constant um, disregard, I think, for human decency as well as his befriending of autocratic leaders around the world and his uh, continued pursuit of relationships to benefit himself as opposed to the country, I do think that America's standing in the world has also been tarnished. But I think even more fundamentally, what he is doing here in the United States is very polarizing and he is, I think, the most divisive president we've ever had in the Oval Office. He is feeding and fueling uh, hatred and animosity and misunderstandings among Americans. And so I am very concerned when I look at some of the tweets that are out there and commentary, uh, we are just uh, fighting with each other as a nation. And this is something that the President of the United States traditionally has been the one to try to heal these domestic wounds, these domestic problems. But I think Donald Trump has failed repeatedly to try to do that. He continues just to play to his base of support and feeds them, basically with raw meat, uh, a lot of this language that tends to get them riled up. That is not something that is in our nation's security. I want to draw on your experience uh, prior to being CIA director <clears throat> when you worked in the Obama administration as an assistant to the president for 
Homeland Security, by the way, at exactly the same pay grade as Omarosa. Uh, that that we what this story reveals this week is that we have a White House in which the president is saying, as of today, that he knowingly hired someone who he believed at the time was unqualified, brought them in there at that top pay grade, and that this person has now proven uh, that within the White House, uh, she was taping, she was recording conversations, including recording her final conversation uh, with the White House Chief of Staff, uh, which apparently took place in the Situation Room or in a room close to the Situation Room. Well, I think it's been very clear from the beginning of this administration that it has not done a very good job of vetting for senior personnel assignments. Number one. Number two, the fact that there has been now acknowledged by the White House that senior staff officers have been asked to sign a non disclosure agreement, I find mind boggling. That is something that never would have occurred to President Obama, President Bush, President Clinton, or others. But the fact that Donald Trump feels this sense of insecurity that he has to get people to sign these uh, agreements really, I think, reflects just the lack of sophistication, the, the lack of competence and a lack of, of trust that uh, people within the White House have for, for one another. So I, I do not uh, you know, agree that you know, Amorasu should have you know, taped that uh, conversation with John Kelly, but I also scratched my head to try to figure out why did John Kelly have that conversation with her in the White House Situation Room, which is a venue that's usually reserved for national security matters to talk about classified information. If he was going to relieve her of her duties, uh, he should have done that in his office. Uh, that is the place where something like that would have been done. So it's just very puzzling. Uh, I, I want to get to a, a policy matter that is unprecedented and that is going to be with us long after the Omarosa controversy has been left behind. And that is a president of the United States who actually tweeted, tariffs are the greatest, a sentence that has never been spoken by a president before, including some of our uh, hi uh, historic champions of tariffs uh, in the distant past. You respond to that, to that by saying, using tariffs as a blunt force instrument against allies and partners is not only short but also plays into the hands of Russia and China. Same is true with bombastic rhetoric against Iran. We need to be smarter, more sophisticated, more strategic. Uh, what is the, the tariff uh, regime that Donald Trump has imposed doing to national security? Well, it's alienating our closest allies and partners, whether you're talking about Canada or countries within the European Union, uh, using this tariff as a way to try to level all bilateral trade with other countries is just foolhardy. And so this is something that I think both Moscow and Beijing can point to and say to our uh, former allies and partners uh, that the United States cannot be counted upon, that uh, we're going to treat you more fairly, we're going to try to uh, replace the United States as a, as a trusted uh, partner, a trade partner. And so using tariffs across the board, I think it just again shows that Mr. Trump really doesn't understand international politics, international economics, as well as how this global world operates and interoperates today. It is something that I think he is very short-sighted about, and it may make uh, for good uh, noise on the campaign uh, trail. But it is not a good geopolitics at all. One of the important enlightenments of the second half of the 20th century was that international trade with countries dramatically reduces the likelihood of war with those countries. Uh, if we are shipping them Coca-Cola, Levi's, or anything else uh, that we're making, soybeans, uh, and they're shipping things to us, the, the economic theory was that will create an, an important and peaceful kind of interdependence. It, was, it used to be thought of as part of defense policy. This seems lost on this White House. Well, absolutely. And that's why when I mentioned that the world, it needs to be as interoperable as possible because the movement of, of goods and products and services and people across borders is what allows countries to, to prosper. And if we're going to halt that and put these tariffs on different goods and services and to prevent that, that flow of, of people as well as of technologies and other things, it really is going to inhibit the continued growth of our, our world. Uh, and so again, this is something that uh, I think Mr. Trump has really deviated from the former you know, U.S. policy of previous administrations, which is that the United States, yes, is bigger and 
stronger than any other country, but we're going to use our economic power, our political and military power, in order to bring peace, prosperity to the world. Because if all boats rise, that helps the United States national security. And unfortunately, I do think that Russia and China are pointing now to the untrustworthiness of the United States as a way to make headway with a number of countries around the world. Former CIA Director John Brennan, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Lawrence. Coming up, Donald Trump's former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, has decided, and this was a very big roll of the dice in the courtroom today, that his best defense is to remain absolutely silent. Today, after the prosecution of Paul Manafort put 27 witnesses on the witness stand, Paul Manafort's criminal defense lawyers rolled the dice on silence. The Manafort defense is silence, not one word of testimony from the Manafort defense. Paul Manafort is facing the risk of a sentence that could put him in prison for the rest of his life, and he did not take the stand in his own defense. And his lawyers called no witnesses in Paul Manafort's defense. Instead, the defense immediately asked the judge for a directed verdict of not guilty because they said the prosecution did not present evidence that Paul Manafort committed the crimes he is charged with. The judge, T.S. Ellis, immediately denied the defense's motion for a directed verdict, as is customary in these cases. Judge indicated that he was satisfied that the prosecution did indeed present evidence that Paul Manafort was possibly guilty of all 18 counts that he is charged with, it will now be up to the jury to decide if the prosecution proved that Paul Manafort is guilty of those counts beyond a reasonable doubt. Final arguments by the prosecution and defense are scheduled for tomorrow morning. The jury will begin deliberating Paul Manafort's fate tomorrow afternoon. No matter what the outcome of this trial is, Paul Manafort faces a second prose prosecution by Special Prosecutor Robert Mueller's team in Washington, D.C. next month on charges including money laundering and failing to register as a foreign agent in connection with his lobbying work in Ukraine. Joining our discussion now is Chuck Rosenberg, a former senior FBI official and a former federal prosecutor. He's also an MSNBC contributor. And back with us, John Heilman. Uh, Chuck Rosenberg, for courtroom aficionados, when you really like to just sit there and watch the pictures on both sides, there's, there are few things more tense than watching the defense rest without putting on a single witness. It is a very tense roll of the dice for the defense in those cases. You know, Lawrence, you're right, but given two very bad options, putting on no defense at all, which is what they chose to do, and putting on a defense perhaps where Mr. Manafort takes the stand and is subjected to a withering cross-examination, and by the way, it would be withering, I think they made the better choice. In all of my years as a federal prosecutor, I found that the prosecution case usually gets stronger when the defense puts on its case. And uh, John Heilman, uh, for uh, Trump cheerleaders out there who were waiting for the Manafort defense, uh, they've got nothing to work with tonight. They got nothing to work with. And, you know, I, the thing that I, I, I'm not a lawyer, and I, 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 so I, I listen to smart people like Chuck Rosenberg, and I've, I've heard a couple different views about this. And you know, some people in the defense world are a little surprised, not that they didn't put on Manafort, because clearly that yeah. would be a disaster, but they didn't at least put out a couple token witnesses to give something for people mm -hmm. to hang their hat on. Um, I think, you know, look, in the end, and, and again, not a lawyer uh, or even a legal analyst, but you know, the power of this case was always the paper. And that's what we heard over and over again mm -hmm. from experts on both sides, prosecutors and defense alike. And for all of the things we saw, Rick Gates, everything on the stands, pictures of ostrich coats and everything else, in the end, on this kind of a case, the paper tells the story. And, and if the paper is as compelling as the prosecution believes, it doesn't seem to me that almost anything that's happened in the courtroom really is going to matter. And uh, Chuck Rosenberg, I heard one, I just want to isolate one section of testimony that when I read it in the transcript, I believed I was looking at uh, evidence of a crime, evidence that was not in any way contradicted in cross-examination 
by the defense. And then, since the defense put on no defense, it hasn't been contradicted at all. And that was about uh, the disclosure of foreign bank accounts. A Treasury official testified, who's an investigator of these kinds of matters. A prosecution asked, did you conduct a search of whether Paul Manafort filed an FBAR for the tax years 2011, 2012, 2013, and 2014? These are in, uh, reports indicating that there were uh, foreign bank accounts. The witness says there were none filed. Uh, absolutely none. Prosecution, thank you, they're done. Uh, no contradiction of that from the defense. What can possibly be in the final argument that a juror could cling to, something in the defense final argument, that could lead to a not guilty on that count? Yeah, the, <clears throat> excuse me. The argument that the defense will have to make here, Lawrence, is that Mr. Manafort lacked the intent to fail to report these foreign bank accounts, meaning he sure didn't, he sure had them, uh, but the reason it's not a crime, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, is that it was an omission, it was a mistake. The government has to show that when he uh, failed to report those accounts that he acted intentionally. And so I imagine that will be the argument, but I think you're right. These are very, very difficult charges uh, for a defendant to sort of evade. If you have foreign bank accounts, they produce income, and you report neither the income nor the existence of those accounts on your uh, income tax returns, you're usually doing it for a reason, and that's to cheat the federal government. We're going to have to squeeze in a break here. John Howman, thank you for joining us once again. Today, the White House press secretary was asked if it would be a violation of Department of Justice rules if Robert Mueller's investigation continues beyond September 1st. Last week, Rudy Giuliani insisted that it would be a violation of the Justice Department rules for the investigation to continue, but we now have documentary proof that the Mueller investigation will continue after September 1st. Chuck Rosen, uh, Rosenberg will explain, explain that proof next. Rudy Giuliani insists that Robert Mueller's investigation must end by September 1st, but someone's going to have to fire Robert Mueller to make that happen because the special prosecutor's office has subpoenaed an associate of Roger Stone's to testify to the grand jury on September 7th. Rudy Giuliani is, of course, lying when he says there is a Justice Department rule that requires the Mueller investigation to end on September 1st. The White House press secretary was unwilling to repeat that lie today. Does the president or this White House believe that it is a violation of Department of Justice protocol if the special counsel's investigation goes beyond September 1st? Uh, I'm not going to say that we would say necessarily a specific violation, but I think we've been very clear that uh, not only do we, but all of the American people want this to wrap up. She proved once again that she does not speak for the American people. A new poll shows that 70 percent of Americans want President Trump to testify under oath to Special Prosecutor Robert Mueller. Chuck Rosenberg is back with us. And Chuck, uh, the September 1st rule, uh, Rudy Giuliani uh, just invented somewhere, I guess. Yeah, Lawrence, in a shocking development, uh, <laughs> Mr. Giuliani does not know what he's talking about. There is a memo from then Attorney General Eric Holder in 2012, which tells all department prosecutors that they may not interfere in an election. But leading up to an election, you can still take um, covert, quiet investigative steps. You just can't take overt investigative steps. And by the way, if the Mueller team feels that they need to suspend something between September 1st or October 1st, some date, and the election, all they have to do is hit pause. And the day after the election, they can hit pause again and do everything they could have done uh, yesterday or tomorrow. So. Uh, this makes absolutely no sense. I want to take you back to the issue of uh, the Paul Manafort defense. And some people staring at it today say it looks like a defense that is geared to a pardon, uh, offering no witnesses, putting on no defense at all in the courtroom. Uh, what would be the result if Paul Manafort is convicted of any of the, count, the counts that he faces uh, in this trial? What would happen if he if the president pardoned him uh, after the fact of those convictions? As the president may do at any time. Uh, so what would happen is that the slate would be wiped entirely clean. I imagine if there was a pardon, it would include not only the charges in Virginia, but the charges in the District of Columbia. However, that doesn't mean that Bob Mueller still couldn't question Paul Manafort. 
Uh, nothing would preclude uh, Mueller right then and there from issuing him a grand jury subpoena and requiring him to testify as to everything he knows in the grand jury. So a pardon wipes clean the convictions, but it sure doesn't wipe clean the information. Chuck Rosenberg, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Coming up, we have a winner in the prime Democratic primary election for Paul Ryan's congressional seat tonight. Steve Kornacki will join us next. It is primary night in four states tonight, including Wisconsin, where we have a winner in the Democratic primary for Paul Ryan's seat in Congress. Joining us now is Steve Kornacki. Steve, what is the latest on Paul Ryan's district? Let's take a look. You see it here, southeast Wisconsin, Democratic primary. This name here familiar to a lot of Democratic activists nationally. His name, Randy Bryce. He had a viral video about a year ago. He is an iron worker, a union activist. He put a video up. He challenged Paul Ryan, who at that point he thought would be his opponent in this race. He challenged him to trade jobs with him. Bryce raised millions of dollars, got lots of attention. Of course, Paul Ryan has subsequently announced he's not running for re-election. So this district up for grabs in November. Randy Bryce, he had some issues here uh, down the stretch in this primary campaign. Some revelations of some old arrests, one for DUI, came out. But he's won the Democratic primary. He's certainly shown he can raise money. Who will he face off against? We have a winner as well in the Republican primary primary his name Brian style Brian style is a former aide to Paul Ryan so Paul Ryan's former aide will face off against Randy Bryce the Democrat in this district here in Wisconsin this is a, a pretty competitive district when Ryan was the VP nominee with Mitt Romney in 2012 that ticket only carried this district by four points not out of reach for Democrats other races quickly we can get to here number one uh, for the governorship of Minnesota this right now shaping up as the surprise of the night we know this name Tim Pawlenty former governor of Minnesota former presidential candidate he is waging a comeback bid in Minnesota, and look at this. He has hit some serious trouble in the Republican primary in Minnesota. Jeff Johnson, he was the Republican candidate for governor in 2014. He is leading now with more than half the vote in by 10 points, a 16, 17,000 vote margin over Plenty. Looking at the map, it is getting tough to see where Plenty could make this up. This also just a fascinating race because it illustrates so much about the Republican Party today. In 2016, Plenty called Donald Trump unhinged and unqualified Johnson called Trump something I'm not even sure I can say on TV yet they had a debate in this campaign they both debated over who meant it less they both <laughs> wanted to line up with Donald Trump and his supporters in this campaign Johnson though again this could be the big surprise and who would he face if he does hang on and win in the Democratic side it looks like Tim Walls Congressman Tim Walls from the southern part of Minnesota he is in very good position again just when you look at where the votes are coming in from here and finally Lawrence quickly the other sort of headline race out out of Minnesota tonight. Let's see if we can get that. Keith Ellison in the race for attorney general. He's going to win this thing comfortably. And of course, the X factor with Ellison, those last minute allegations of domestic violence. What, if anything, becomes of those in the days ahead? Because right now, Democrats are going to nominate him uh, to be their candidate in the fall. Steve Kornacki, thank you very much for the update. Appreciate yep. it. Tonight's last word is next. Time for tonight's last word. Last night, I opened the show with a tweet from Patricia McClary. She said, if you talk about Omarosa tonight when there are 700 children still separated from their parents, then I will turn you off. And of course, I did open the show uh, talking about Omarosa, and I tried to make the connection between the Omarosa story and those children who are still separated from their parents at the southern border, the incompetence of the Trump administration that has those children still separated at the southern border, and the cruelty of the Trump administration that separated them in the first place. I tried to make that connection. Uh, today on Twitter, uh, Patricia McClary gave us her reaction. She said uh, about seeing her tweet on the show last night, it was pretty cool, took me by surprise. So then I had to watch the show. I consider it an honor to be mentioned on the last word. I always watch him, but held out hope that Omarosa would be put aside for more important matters. Lawrence tried to make the connection, but, uh, and Patricia in other tweets made it clear that she does not believe uh, that I successfully made that uh, connection and was in fact 
disappointed that I handled it that way. And so Patricia McClary got the first word last night. She gets the last word tonight. Hey, it's Chris Hayes from MSNBC. You know, every day I come to the office and we make a television show. And every day I think to myself, there's so much more I want to talk about. And so this is our podcast. It's called Why Is This Happening? And the whole idea behind it is to get to the root of the things that we see play out every day. They're driven by big ideas. Each week, I sit down with a person uniquely suited to explain why this is happening. New episodes of Why Is This Happening every Tuesday. Listen for free wherever you get your podcasts.